today um I'm actually very excited to have uh, Tibet share with us. Uh, he's been hanging out in our community for a while. I've been lurking in his community for a while. Uh, there is a lot of really interesting ideas. He's uh, a veteran of a lot of this DAO thinking before he was called DAOs um, with uh, a whole set of ideas, terminologies, and a lot of deep thinking about economic, social relationships, and so on that I have very much appreciated uh, the few conversations and interactions that we have had. And so I'll, Tibet, I'll let you explain a little bit more about your open value network and your current setup and all of that, as I imagine there are a few elements that will be part of the talk anyway. Uh, so I won't ruin the surprise nor miss explain it for everyone else. Uh, but just to say, um, I'm very, very excited about the, the crossroads and cross-pollination that we can have here. Uh, as we explore how a lot of these ideas that have been evolving in other areas outside Web3 that can be really powerful, we can apply some of the own learnings that we have had in this space and, and really together crack this super difficult problem of human collaboration in the digital age. So without further ado, uh, Tibet, please, over to you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Daniel. Great to be here. Um, <clears throat> I guess I'm going to share my screen and present for a bit before we shift to conversation. And um, I was realizing, all right, can you see that now? Yep. Cool. Okay, great. Um, yeah, I was realizing that this is actually the first time that I've presented about the Collaborative Technology Alliance, except briefly as part of a, a panel once. Um, but really this is a community that has been a little bit in the background and uh, so this is a totally new presentation. It's not pretty, um, and I'm curious to see what I end up saying. Um, but before we get there, uh, just briefly, who am I? I call myself a, a communitarian technologist. I've been building software since I was eight and also very, always very driven by how to bring people together into community. Uh, did the kind of startup entrepreneur thing for a number of years and kind of over and over again, saw the things that I was trying to build and, you know, trying to, how I was trying to impact the world and do something good for the world, get kind of corrupted or co-opted or, or even just destroyed by uh, capitalism for maybe a lack of a, a better word, but uh, that's the core of it. And, and kind of the, the VC backed structures of pushing for growth and exit and um, things like that were, were getting in the way of the, the visions I was trying to bring into the world. So I founded the Terran Collective uh, with some friends eight years ago as a container to experiment with different models of ownership and governance and um, value exchange, and specifically to work on systems and tools for collaboration and cooperation. Um, and it's been a really interesting journey. There's many stories there. Um, actually, we worked on DowStack for a couple of years. We were the, the sort of dev team building their alchemy tool, one of some of the first DAO tooling software. Um, and then more recently shifted kind of away from Web3, quote unquote Web3, um, to work on this platform, Hilo, which was uh, originally a, a VC backed for-profit community platform um, that kind of ran out of money. It was kind of ahead of the wave of, of community platforms. They started in like 2013, 2014. Um, and, and they ended up getting bought by Holochain, who kind of acquired the team and using some of the code for their, some of their first messaging apps on their peer-to-peer -peer, um, distributed sort of app framework. If you don't know Holochain, um, they're very cool. Um, but they weren't planning to maintain the current platform, and so they gifted Hilo to the Terran Collective. And so we've been working on this Web2 community platform really primarily focused on how do we build tools that enable groups of humans to cooperate better. And so, you know, I'm really interested in the Web3 world, worked on DAOs for a while, but also saw, especially at that time in the kind of early DAO days, there was a lot of still money getting in the way of, of things happening in, in truly kind of cooperative pro-social ways, pro-social meaning kind of behavior for the good of the whole. Um, and also just a lot of like trying to hack around human foibles with code and hoping that 
kind of the right set of smart contracts will solve a lot of like human soft governance issues. Um, so we've, we've been focusing more on how can just like a, a community platform with the basic foundational communication tools um, that, you know, people use Discord for now in their DAOs or Telegram, how can we have those tools really like support and enable a pathway to becoming more pro-social, more cooperative over time, and then start to integrate with uh, Web3 tools for governance and things like that. So that's a, also a story for another time. Um, maybe we can talk more about it later. But one of the things that we that came along with Hilo was a community called the Collaborative Technology Alliance that was founded in 2015 or 2016 by the Hilo founders. And actually, I can kind of get into here. A bunch of other um, kind of open source tools and platforms like Lumio and Metamaps and the Inspiral network uh, out of New Zealand who are like really thinking about these alternative structures of, of doing things together and how to build tools that are both creating a, a kind of tool set of open source collaborative tools, but also doing it in a more cooperative way. Um, they also kind of ran out of steam after a couple of years and when Hilo came to the Terran Collective, um, the founders were like, do you want to reboot this Collaborative Technology Alliance? Here's all this information about it. Here's the people who are involved. There's a Hilo group of now, I think it's like 600 people there. Um, and so after a, 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 maybe a year of working on Hilo, six months, we decided to give it a try and like see what juice is there. Because we felt like we weren't going to succeed in our mission as another little silo or just kind of on our own. We wanted to find all the people with similar values working on similar tools and see if we could collaborate and create interoperable platforms. Um, so for a while, it was just me kind of holding the space, inviting people who used to be involved in the CTA, other people working on similar tools that I knew about. Um, in our first experiment, I put these little, you know, sparkle emojis next to things that I think of as experiments that we've tried um, in terms of leadership and governance was just to invite who else in the community wants to step into a, a stewardship role with me and kind of hold the, you know, be the core decision making body. And I'm very inspired by sociocracy as a model of distributed distributing power and responsibility and leadership. Um, so sociocracy always starts with like a general circle. Um, that's the you could think of them as like the founders, the, the initial folks who are really holding the project. And then additional circles can kind of sprout off of that with specific domains of responsibility. Um, there's a lot more about sociocracy we could also get into. Um, I was able to raise some money from a cool organization called One Project. And we, you know, our first experiment with money was just to pay the stewards a little monthly stipend to kind of hold that pillar of responsibility um, and to commit hours and, and push things forward. And we started out by just hosting calls with a lot of different interesting projects in the space, building relationship. Again, I would say one of my like core beliefs is that building relationship and building trust is foundational to any community, any project, any network, any ecosystem really succeeding in the long run. Um, and started some like small collaborations working on like, how do we, how could we share, you know, how could our user data potentially be portable and or flow across our platforms? What are our different user schemas? Thinking about like how we want to do interoperable chat across platforms, different little experiments happened. Um, and, you know, we had these sort of high level goals of, of weaving together this network of pro-social, humane, responsible, collaborative technologists, however you want to think of it. Um, mapping who's out there, making ourselves more visible to each other, building trust, sharing about what we're doing. So we kind of stay up to date um, and we can more easily collaborate um, and, you know, actually working on stuff together and, and figuring out like what's the best path towards interoperability. Um, and I will, I will say that like the community that came together here is Web3 adjacent, but it's, it's actually not really quite in the Web3 world. Like most of the platforms and projects are not Web3 or not blockchain projects. There's some, there's definitely some overlap. Um, and there's, yeah, that's sort of an interesting thing to potentially talk about as well. Um, a couple other pieces just about the history. Like we had this group of bait stewards for a while. That was like, too, not a lot could happen. There's too many people. So we trimmed down to four 
and really had like a, a period where a lot of activity happened. We created a, a pledge with some principles that I'll go through about what we're really standing for. We got an amazing domain somehow. We got collaborative.tech and launched a landing page. We did have a, a presentation on a panel at, at South by that was the only other time I've really talked about the CTA publicly besides our calls. Um, decided we wanted to work on growth and kind of figure out our membership and governance and, and you know, yeah, activate some more collaboration. But, you know, let me start with kind of where we've landed as our purpose and our principles. Um, you can read this on your own, but these is, this is the core of, or maybe I'll just read it. We facilitate collaboration, coordination, and community among platform designers, developers, and stewards committed to building social technology in service to a thriving world for all. So it's, you know, it's beyond just the, like, the tech, like what, how we're building things, what's the like architecture, what's the, um, yeah, the foundational piece. It's, it's a lot, it's, it's also about like, what are we building and how is it in service to a world that works for all? Um, I'll just kind of briefly, all of this text you can find on the website actually. So I don't need to really go too deep into each principle, but wanted to briefly highlight each of them. Um, the focus on the kind of holistic well-being of of people and planet, uh, co-creation, collaboration, cooperation, like that is foundational to what we're trying to facilitate and do. And all these principles, you know, we, we try and think about both, you know, it's related to the technology we want to be a part of this alliance, but also how we want to work together. Um, certainly individual and collective agency, privacy, security, creating things that work for all. Justice, um, this is a important thing for me. I mean, really believing that technology is not neutral and too often technologists say, oh, it's just a tool and depends on how you use it. But the design of technology has a huge influence on culture. Um, culture and technology influence each other in a often not so virtuous cycle, <laughs> at least with the tech that is dominant today. Um, so this is core to our work as well. Um, Openness, transparency, open source, data portability. Um, yeah. And, you know, this is, is a very emergent network um, with not a lot of structure yet. We keep trying to give it more structure and it keeps kind of not working. <laughs> um, so it's still a pretty loose uh, emergent network. Some of the folks who play in the space. Um, I'm not going to go too much into each of these, but just wanted to show that. So, you know, for a for a while, there was just a lot of like community building, networking, sharing what was going on, um, and some collaborations happening. Definitely, like, yeah, some really great relationships that have formed, and um, we decided to use the most of the last chunk of our initial funding to run a collabathon as a way to try and spark um, some more, you know, actual projects happening among people in the network. And basically, this happened over the first half of 2022. Uh, oh wait, no, this was last year, 2023. Sorry. Um, basically, it's an extended hackathon where folks in the community put forward projects that they're already working on or wanted to work on for funding. Um, but instead of having kind of a judges or, you know, a panel deciding like how the fund, the funding gets distributed, we used a consent based decision making process. And so again, this kind of comes from the world of sociocracy and it was a, I would say a slightly radical experiment. Um, the idea being that we, come to agreement as a group of Collabathon participants about how to distribute the money. Um, the different difference between consensus and consent is somewhat subtle, but, but meaningful in practice. Um, consensus is usually thought of as like everyone agreeing, everyone saying yes, whereas consent is no one saying no. Um, you know, is this safe enough for now, good enough to try? And uh, the only objections that really will count are ones that are like very reasoned and reasonable and say like, I think if this proposal moves forward, it will go against the goals of 
this project or this organization. So it was it was super interesting, and we did we succeeded ultimately. Um, we tried using Lumio as our decision making platform, and with mixed results, we actually ended up using a really like basic spreadsheet that was kind of interesting, where we compared different people's um, suggestions and played with different ways to kind of find uh, uh, something that would make the most people happy and no one block it. Um, we also played with a tool called the Fellow, which uh, is a really interesting participatory decision-making platform, really good for complex participatory budgeting decisions that kind of would have handled a lot of this for us, but we didn't really get ramped up with it in time. Um, so yeah, that was super interesting. We, we did succeed in, in coming to agreement in, to consent on how to fund various projects. Um, and some of the projects that came out of it are, are still going and are, are pretty, uh, are cool. Yeah, one of them was originally this called an ecosystem incubator. And the idea was to actually create an entity around the CTA, create like a potentially a sort of commons where we could share IP and co-fundraise and bring some of, some of the work from various platforms and tools into a shared entity. We ended up not pursuing that um, for now. Um, we kind of pivoted to just creating a, a resource library with a lot of information about um, how to start pro-social tech projects, like which entity structure to potentially use, which funding models are perhaps the most likely to support the goals of a pro-social tech project. Um, which governance models. So that's uh, in the works and will be coming soon. There is a, an interesting project around, originally it was like, how do we set up uh, decentralized identifiers that will work across our network? Um, it's shifted a little bit to what they're calling now sovereign pass keys called the Federated Authentication Network. I can share links to all of these in the chat as well. Um, there's another interesting project around creating what we're calling a dynamic interoperable ecosystem map. There's so many people out there who like create ecosystem maps by you know just creating an Airtable and people can submit things and then it has to be manually maintained and it never stays up to date. The idea here is it uses this uh, murmurations protocol, which is basically just a public repo of schemas um, and uh, People can then publish, so publish an organizational schema from their website, from their, whatever, from Hilo, from whatever tool they're using that where they like have their main project or organizational website. And then there is an aggregator, an index that sort of aggregates all these profiles that can be um, pinged and you know, has various APIs and also validates that the profiles are fit the schema. And then um, the map is can be automatically generated from this index. And if people need to update their information on it or want to remove themselves from the map, it's all they can control that all themselves. Um, so that is also something that is kind of about to be released into the world, which I think will be pretty interesting. Uh, there's a project called Green Check, which is kind of a Gitcoin like proof of personhood where you can like get all of your different profiles linked up to one identity. Um, the, hum the Humans United for Mutual Aid and Networks is a little bit harder to explain. It's just basically bringing together a set of open source tools to support mutual aid. Uh, but there's some pretty interesting projects involved there. Um, one called Holons, which is about flow funding across nested groups. So, yeah, I mean, since then, we've, you know, these projects have been the main focus. There's been some good progress without a lot of money, right? This is a very small amount of money. And so it's, there's a lot of just like volunteer energy and effort going in so far. We did raise a bit more money. We're still trying to figure out what to do with that. Some of the stewards had to step back and there's kind of new ones stepping in. And, and we're still trying to kind of figure out what is this, the, the main role of this alliance. Um, we had a, a sort of general assembly meeting a few weeks ago, which was basically like having holding our stewards meeting, but inviting anyone there, to, anyone else to show up and participate in discussion about um, different decisions. And yeah, there's, there's a lot of like questions we continue to, to ask. Um, are we really just a community? Are we, should we be more of an organization uh, or both? 
you know, the, the, was there sort of the continual cycle of how do we make decisions collectively and distribute responsibility and power more widely? Um, every like again, like every time we've tried to put in a much more formal kind of membership and governance structure, hasn't quite happened for various reasons, <laughs> um, and maybe it hasn't really been needed. Um, there's also a lot of different folks that have stepped into this space in recent years. Um, obviously, a lot of people in the DAO world, which, again, it feels like almost like a parallel related similar conversations happening, but with slightly different language um, and slightly different technology. And, you know, and this this question of like interoperability, there's so many people thinking about this. I mean, there's obviously the activity pub world and the kind of federated world. Holochain continues to be friends that we explore adopting and they finally are starting to achieve a bit of liftoff and be ready for people to to work, to build apps on top of their peer-to-peer -peer structure that uses to distributed hash tables instead of um, a blockchain. Uh, there's protocols like the distributed or decentralized social networking protocol, Noster and Blue Sky and standards like RSS, so many different blockchains. And it's never been quite clear to me you know, I, maybe I didn't quite frame this at the beginning fully clearly. It's like most of the, the projects here are about social tech, like social networking, places, community tools, places for people to connect with each other, do stuff together. Um, it's kind of embedded in the word collaborative, but I just wanted to clarify that. And so, and I actually think that social networks on the blockchain doesn't really make that much sense for various reasons. Um, but there are so many people trying to figure out how to create uh distributed or decentralized architectures for social networking um so there's been for me personally and i think for a lot of people in the alliance there's a little bit of a wait and see like what is going to ultimately be the architecture of for the future of the internet <laughs> um and and also i will say that there's definitely some some lack of resources that has made it hard to fully um, activate in the ways that we would like So yeah, this question of like, where are we now? Where are we going next? Um, all the, the those projects from the Collabathon are, or many of them are like about ready to to launch into the world in a more significant way, having starting this kind of resource library, this dynamic ecosystem map. There's a number of people who talk about maybe the CTA being almost like a standards body and, and having a kind of nutrition label based on our principles, um, helping pick and encourage certain standards and protocols to for people to adopt um are there yeah specific projects we should put our weight behind and and can we potentially merge our efforts more and co-fundraise or even join forces in a single entity um these are some of the questions we continue to explore and you know all of this is very relevant to me and my work in Hilo too and i think you know, I obviously come, this presentation was primarily about the CTA, but most of my work is on Hilo and the CTA is a little bit of a like side project, community building effort. Um, and yeah, I think that's it. Um, happy to take questions and dive into discussion on all of this. And I see there's been definitely some chats I can yeah, look at um... as well. I, I mean, yeah, to get to get started, uh, I had seen a question from Drea, and I'm super curious about it as well. Um, after that, if anyone else wants to ask a question, feel free to just raise your hand with the this thing, the reactions button in the middle. Um, so you you mentioned that Lumio didn't quite work. Uh, would love to understand why that was, or how, how did it play out? Um, <clears throat> so. I don't know how many people have used Lumio, but it's it's basically um, just a place to create proposals and discuss proposals and vote on them. And there's different, like maybe a little bit like Snapchat, Snapchat, uh, yeah. <laughs> Snapshot <laughs> in the web free world. Um, but uh, yeah, let's see. I mean, first of all, you know, the CTA lives mostly in Hilo and um, just getting people to use another platform was a thing. And then Lumio, it's very flexible. 
but it's also, I think the user experience is not great in some ways. And we found that like we weren't clear if we should have like one proposal running at the same time and then people discussing that proposal and then iterating and we iterate on it or like a bunch of different proposals. And when there were multiple proposals that people were looking at at the same time, it just became very confusing to kind of compare between them and figure out where discussion should be happening. Um, and then where to like synthesize, like the way that the consent process works is like you have, generally you have, you should have like one proposal and then you discuss it and then you, you know, there may be objections or blocks, and then you try and integrate those proposals, those suggestions or objections into the proposal, and then you have a new proposal. Um, part of the problem was we, as the like hosts of the Collabathon, didn't do a good job of nailing down our process before the Collabathon started, and we were kind of, you know, trying to build the airplane while we were flying a little bit. And so, and another thing about Lumio that was a little bit strange is. After people started voting, you could go change the proposal still, um, which caused some significant confusion at times when people were voting on a proposal and then it got changed. And we were like, oh, God, now, like, are we, do we have to reset the votes somehow and start over or like what? Yeah. So that, yeah, it was interesting that we, and then Othello, which I actually think would have been ideal, um, we just got started with it too late in the process and there would have been a lot of everyone learning it and ramping up and setting it up. And it was kind of just, yeah, it was a little bit too late once we started thinking about that. Um, it, it was fascinating that like ultimately this spreadsheet where people put in their different options and we could easily compare them and look at how we like average or, you know, shift numbers was definitely the best way to do things. And I think it would have worked well if we just started with that. The, the main problem with that is we were all looking at it together and there was definitely some biasing by the first person who put their proposal there, which was me. Um, and that would have been solved by using Othello or, you know, using a, some Web3 on-chain voting platform. Um, you know, if, with Othello, everybody, it's very similar to the spreadsheet in a way. It's like everybody puts together their ideal distribution of funding we knowing we have the 30,000, how do we, how do I think we should distribute it among these projects? And then it does some magic in the background to synthesize and come up with the one or maybe like two or three best options that the most people would be the most happy with and no one would object to. Um, so, and then there's many parameters for how that can be set up, but yeah, we just didn't quite get there. Actually, maybe I'll stop sharing so we can see each other's faces better. Um, I can just look through the chat. Is Quaker decision making a considered a version of sociocracy? Um, I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean, I, in sociocracy, the idea is to have small circles that have specific domains of decision making. I don't know enough. I mean, the thing I know about Quaker decision making is like there's big general meetings where people participate, but I actually don't know what the process of decision making is. If you want to share more about that, but sociocracy is like, keep the group that's making decisions together small and make sure they have a really clear domain that they're allowed to make decisions in. And then within that group use consent. So there's like a total agreement and then you're most likely to have the most buy-in. And there's also a, you know, a, a sort of advice process where people are supposed to get the advice of all important stakeholders before they put together proposals um, and just more details about like how the proposal process works. But um, I'm not sure how similar or different that is to Quaker decision making. Farcaster, yeah, Farcaster is starting to take off and I haven't tuned in enough to what's going on in that network. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Let me um, trail over to you. Too much me. Um, so I'm interested in sort of you, you guys talk about collaboration tech and pro social, but then I'm hearing a lot of stuff about social networking. Um, and so I'm sort of curious about sort of how you define the boundaries of what CTA is working on, especially like what you aren't doing. I mean, we haven't really defined that boundary besides the principles and the pledge. Um, 
you know, I think it's, it's sort of a, like people are drawn to a certain energy and a certain language and those principles or they're not. Um, that's, that's the biggest definition of like, you know, who shows up <laughs> based on what we're putting out. Um, pro social, if you haven't heard of, there's a book called pro social that I highly recommend, um, with a bunch of, uh, research by, there's a professor named David Sloan Wilson, who's been yep. kind of researching this stuff for a long time. And it's based on the work of Eleanor Ostrom um, and her Nobel Prize winning research on group cooperation. And it's basically a set of principles and practices to help groups become more cooperative or more pro-social. Um, and so we work actually fairly closely with them on Hilo and um, so there's a sense that like the idea, you know, the, the scope of pro-social is just about group interaction in any context, um, but we are technologists. And so, so we're trying to think of, bring it into the digital world and think about how to create pro-social digital spaces. Um, if that answers your question enough. It does, thank you. <laughs> yeah. The, then there was a question about, you mentioned that blockchain networks might not be ideal for creating these new systems of governance. And they're wondering why that is, what about blockchain might limit groups? Um, <clears throat> I'm not I'm not saying that definitively. I think that, like I said earlier, when I was in the, the Web3 space and working on DAO stack, I mean, I got, honestly got pretty turned off by, <laughs> by the Web3 space in general. Um, there was still just like so much focus on money um, first of all, and a lot of the like early DAOs, like there was still too much connection of, between money and power. Um, and you know, I think that has shifted and it has changed and there's a lot more awareness around that in the DAO space now. Um, there's also just still user experience issues. Like there's a lot of people, I mean, some of the people that are using Hilo are like farmers and you know, communities of, of people that are not very tech savvy um, and are not still, you know, they're not going to create a wallet and figure out how to navigate tokens and exchanges. And so I think that there's a, obviously a lot of amazing stuff happening in the Web3, you know, DAO governance world, and it supports a lot of different use cases, um, especially in the tech world. Um, but, you know, for, you know, what we're working on in Hilo, we're still in the Web2 space trying to support a, a wide range of folks and thinking about where and when is like the right place to do on-chain stuff. And I think it actually might be governance. In fact, just this week, we're talking about integrating with um, DowDow potentially as a, a offering to Hilo groups. It's like, if you want to do your governance on-chain, here's an integration with DowDow. We're also talking about integrating with Othello as a, a sort of web two participatory budgeting process. And we're actually just starting to, to build governance tools into Hilo itself. Um, so, but like trying to make them really simple. Um, so I think it's, yeah, the user experience honestly is, is where the, the issues still come up. Thanks for sharing Artem over to you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I'm just curious, like what are the most interesting examples of collaboration tech? being used outside of this kind of commons oriented cooperative ecosystem that is, you know, I'm personally like fully aligned with, but also I'm just curious, like if the large corporations out there might start using some of this collaboration tech, like what use cases would that be in the first place? What do you think? If the large corporations started using, you mean like, if the metas of the world see what people are building, what might they start to integrate into? Yeah, I mean, their maybe platforms? to rephrase my question, like, what is the what is unique about collaboration tech that is currently, you know, that doesn't exist? Because you know, like, you could say that Notion is collaboration tech, right, or Google Docs. Totally, but. Uh, it feels like we're talking about like about something different here, like about 
people being able to, you know, sense make or uh, I don't know, something like open collective yeah. where they can do the participatory budgeting. And so it, it doesn't, feel, maybe I'm wrong, but it doesn't feel like the adoption yeah. of this stuff is as big as it could be, or I don't know. Yeah, I think that you're right. I think that I think that what is interesting to me and one of the things we're we're trying to do with Hilo that feels like it doesn't we don't quite see it out there is actually just creating a, a super easy to use full stack integrated set of tools. Everybody is everybody needs communication. Everybody you know has their chat app of some kind. Everybody needs collaborative docs. Um, and you know the full stack of integrated tools in a way that is open source, that is not for profit, that is not extractive, that is not you know based on trying to sell you things and you know extract your attention. Um, all those things being like really important <laughs> uh, in what I'm saying here. Um, but you know you have your chat, you have your your docs, and then. Um, you know, sharing resources, having a sort of like wiki, like you know, knowledge management is a key piece of it. Um, everybody generally needs that in their organization or their project. And then once you add governance on top of that, it starts to become really interesting. And I, I know everyone here is interested in that. And I think governance tools are not mainstream yet. They're not widely used. I mean, there's, you know, in some ways you could say like polls, People in, certainly in Slack use polls all the time, or you know, Facebook has polls. But like, how do we start to bring in a little bit more sophisticated governance tools? And then beyond that, again, getting really more into the DAO world is like, how do you manage money together and make decisions about how to use resources as a group? That's again gets to become really interesting. And so, bringing a group into that full stack and making it super easy to use and kind of like guiding them through the process in a, and, and for us, it's like, again, how do we make it as pro social as possible? And so as people are starting to use their tools, you're actually both the set of tools and the, the, the sort of user experience of it. And it is somehow uh, creating more cooperative outcomes um, and more cooperative groups over time. This is the like, this is what you know the nut we're trying to crack. Um, then a whole other piece from the Hilo front that's interesting and important to us is actually place-based coordination. We're very passionate about what we think of as bioregional coordination. Um, so we have a geographic map in Hilo. You can like share, you know, well, there's events, there's asks and offers and resources, all of it can be put on the map and location-based. And we are thinking about and wanting to work on almost like next door like functionality, but you know, orienting people to connect with the people around them and start to like govern <clears throat> as a, you know, outside of traditional government bodies, imagine a, uh, a group of people that live near each other making decisions about what happens in their neighborhood or in the landscape they live in. So that's a whole other piece that we're really excited about that feels important. And also we don't quite see happening out there. Um, and, you know, I think if, if big tech starts adopting some of these things, like that, that's great, but it doesn't take away from the fact that their whole business model is bankrupt and destructive to our society. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question enough. Yeah. Yeah. It's a good answer. Thank you. All right, do we have any other questions or comments or anyone else who would like to chip in into the discussion? Yeah, I'd love to hear from others who are thinking about these things as well. <laughs> Should right. Arunda uh, join CPA? <laughs> um, I'll, I'll chip in really quickly. Um, thank you so much for this um, presentation. Thank you, Daniel and Arundel for um, putting this on. Um, as someone, like I said in my introduction, newer to Web3, um, understanding really what is a good on-chain use and what there there's no business in being on-chain is sort of the single most important question um, coming from a non-tech background, right? I, I 
my I, my mother is a mediator um, and my father's a defense lawyer. And so nothing techy in my world before <laughs> before um, my partner transitioned into the into 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 Web3, um, actually. And so uh, figuring out how Web like what on chain helps right create the future that I want to see versus how to prevent things being on chain, being a permanent record and creating a police state. Um, I spend a lot of time thinking about how I don't, you know, the, the privacy issue, the anonymizing issue, but also, like you said, the incredible power to connect communities um, that the internet has given us that was simply just not possible beforehand. And so really leaning into what are the strengths of um, a world connected through technology and what are the strengths of having an immutable record? Um, and I also see governance as a potential huge role, uh, a space where Web3 can make a lot of difference. Um, my concern is keeping it um, sort of like you said, um, helping to build a world that benefits us as opposed to simply another like sort of tool for control or observation, um, which Web2 has like become. Um, so I really appreciate everyone here uh, and the fact that we can bring people from multiple disciplines together, thinking about these issues together, which is, of course, the best way to come up with not just innovative solutions, but sustainable solutions. Um, so I'm super excited to learn more. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah, it's uh, what, I, what I would suggest is that it's a very, very moving target, like a lot of the wallet issues, purchasing cryptocurrencies and so on now with the the rise of account abstraction and custodial wallets that can be made non-custodial by users later on, um, like the technical infrastructure to address a lot of these challenges now exists. It still requires a lot of work, but the foundations are being laid or the, with the launch of Far, Farcaster recently that allows you to embed frames. Uh, so a frame is essentially anything you wanted, like a connection to another protocol and you can, and you, and they are embedding them in their social, um, social platform. So you can have someone tweeting and then immediately have the purchase button connected to whatever tweet that they're advertising there or talking about a proposal and the button to vote on said proposal directly linked there. So a lot of these things are starting to come together, but clearly where there is still a huge gap that needs to be addressed and that requires very significant resources. And um, I mean, we're at the RDA level, we're doing a lot of work to unlock those pools of funding very recently with Arbitrum, but we're also working with Singularity Net and a few others to, to really advocate for collaboration tech as, um, as a valuable, necessary, foundational bet for many of these ecosystems to succeed, both in terms of getting their infrastructure use and as well as addressing their own governance and operation challenges and those of any other projects solved there. Um, but it's a work in progress, right? Um, like the purpose of these conversations is precisely to bring us together and realize that a lot of these challenges go across these web two, web three divide and uh, um, that a lot of these questions really require that depth and collaborative approach if we're ever going to do something about them. Isabella. Hey everyone, thanks so much, Tibet. That was um, really, really interesting. And actually I, I related quite a lot to just a lot of the points that you were saying, because I've got this anti-party movement or incubator, container, community. And I think, yeah, some of the bullet points um, around, yeah, just how to so-called so define or draw boundaries around it really resonated. And also just to do with community building in general. Um, and then, yeah, related to Artem's last question and just comments in the in the chat because my background is very much, you know, I ran for local government here in London and adoption by real people um, is extremely important, especially with when it's to do with, um, well, my theme with anti-party is democratic empowerment and enhancement and engagement. So, you know, that requires mass adoption and scale. And, you know, the more techie things go, I mean, crypto, web three, it's all, it's all the, you know, it's subsect of, of people before it actually widens to the rest of the people. And I'm very much, I don't know where everyone's based, but 
you know, in East London, for example, I, I join these calls. It's all super cool. We've all got these apps on our phones. And then I go out onto the street and I walk around my local community and nobody that I'm walking past is really going to be using this anytime soon. So yeah, I'm just really keen on like, how can we make all these amazing ideas and, and platforms and tech as accessible as possible to as many people as possible? Yeah. I mean, this is, you know, to a large degree why I went back to web two and I'm kind of waiting <laughs> for to see which of these uh, kind of web three technologies end up being the ones to adopt. Um, yeah, I do. I mean, I'll, I'll put a little plug in for hollow chain. Um, if, if you haven't checked them out, I mean, they're, like I think I mentioned earlier, they're a little bit different from a blockchain. They're peer to peer and they use a distributed hash table as the, the data storage structure, which means that only the people who want to interact with each other, like, you don't, you know, you don't need you know, every device having the full chain and you also don't have centralized kind of like, uh, there's not like a, a one big blockchain that everyone has to interact with. You have these specific hash tables for specific apps for specific groups. Um, but you get a lot of the same, so there's like scalability is not an issue and you get a lot of the same benefits in terms of encryption and privacy. And <clears throat> it's finally reaching a point where there's starting, there's like a bunch of apps you can start to actually use. The main thing still to solve is um, the mobile piece, getting it to work on phones really well. And so that is something that they're actually starting to work on. And I've started working with them a little bit on that as well. Um, <clears throat> Yeah, Artem. No, no, no. I just wanted to do thumbs up and oh, raise cool, hand cool. mistake. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, this sort of peer-to-peer -peer architectures are super interesting. Chris? Yeah, I just wanted to kind of come back to your point. I think, Daniel, the, the, the idea of Farcast, Farcaster is a you know Web3 social app. Uh, and it's been kicking around with Lens and a bunch of other things, not doing very much until recently. And suddenly its usage has spiked mm, tenfold in the past week um, by enabling apps to work within it. Social media is the Web2 app that you're talking about, Tibet, which is the place where you would expect to see apps that encourage pro-social behavior, pro-social activity, and governance app development. Uh, you're not suggesting that, but we're, maybe we're suggesting that. But I think, you know, as we look forward, you know, we, we, I don't expect to see governance apps. I don't know. We've seen some development of government governance, particularly voting, uh, decision-making tools in DeFi. Those, those are the areas that have powered the, the, the sort of voting phenomenon. I think as people have really started to realize the weaknesses of voting uh, to do the, the technical nuances, the political nuances of it, and the vulnerabilities of it, um, the passion for you know different types of voting schemes and, and delegates have started to come along, bicameral approaches, different forms of governance over the past couple of years have started to, to, to come around. Now we've got layer two chains, and there's a, a, there's, they have introduced this concept of community, right? So instead of talking about just a DeFi protocol, we're now talking about how to empower a community to work well together. And then you layer on top of that this kind of much more liquid form of community, which is basically decentralized social. And decentralized social which in which you can embed apps which do voting, which do governance, which do um, all sorts of ways of representing opinions or, or, or casting for opinions or, or allowing for decision making. That is the fertile ground, isn't it, that, that should allow the people to start um, playing with this stuff. Now, I totally buy Isabel, Isabella's point that I haven't seen anybody in my social circle, normal social circle, using Farcast. I get that. But the point of this technology is it's supposed to be under the hood. You're not supposed to know that it's, that it's there. And so as and when Elon's X 
dies, which it is progressively doing, and people will try to find the next thing to form quick communities of social communities, which then obviously require some kind of structure, even as informal as that might mean, they will reach to social tools and start to start to use them. So I, I do think that's, that sort of web free social media is a very, very fertile ground. It doesn't yeah. look much at the moment. I agree. I totally agree. But it's it's the place to watch. Yeah. Um, I do have to jump in a couple minutes, unfortunately, for my next call. But yeah, I mean, I totally agree. And obviously, this is why I'm working in this space. It feels super fertile. And and I think the point of that it's that like the group based structure is is really key is where we're coming from with Pilo. It's like there's so many of these massive public squares. Um, like the Twitter model, but is that even the model that we want to promote? I mean, some of the problems we see with with like social media um, polarization and misinformation are because there's these huge public squares where everybody is just thrown together um, in this kind of mush, and stuff can you know just flow willy nilly, and uh, there's not necessarily like shared values or a shared structure of like what we're doing here. And so I actually think that the future is more group based. And even in my community, I, I see this. Um, most of my friends have stopped using most social media um, and most communication now happens through WhatsApp groups, signal groups, telegram groups, discords, slacks. And, you know, this is the direction we're going with with Hilo as well. But another interesting thing about Hilo is you can though nest groups within each other and create kind of different membranes where groups can live um, and, you know, at infinite nesting. So I think there is a lot to figure out and explore here and still a lot of like different models to explore. And, um, you know, it's much easier to get it to, when you're not trying to get, you know, create a public square where you need hundreds of thousands or millions of people using it for it to be interesting. When you're just focusing on group by group useful tools, then adoption is not as important and it's much more possible. Like you can say, hey, use this tool instead of your Facebook group, your Slack, your Discord, your you know whatever group communication tool you're doing. And we can really do some interesting exploration there. Well, on that note, thank you everyone for, thank you everyone for joining us. We're over time. I hope you have a really lovely rest of the day. Take care everyone and hopefully